Welcome to this week's message from Burwood United Methodist Church. I'm Tim Wood, the Supply Pastor. I will be bringing a message to you entitled, From Sinai to Zion, From Fear to Love, based on Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 29. You haven't drawn near to something that can be touched, a burning fire, darkness, shadow, a whirlwind, a blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words that made the ones who heard it beg that there wouldn't be one more word. They couldn't stand the command, if even a wild animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so frightening that Moses said, I'm terrified and shaking. But you have drawn near to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, to countless angels in a festival gathering, to the assembly of God's firstborn children who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than Abel's blood. See to it that you don't resist the one who is speaking. If the people didn't escape when they refused to listen to the one who warned them on earth, how will we escape if we reject the one who is warning from heaven? His voice shook the earth then, but now he has made a promise. Still once more I will shake not only the earth, but heaven also. The words still once more reveal the removal of what is shaken, the things that are part of this creation, so that what isn't shaken will remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken, let's continue to express our gratitude. With this gratitude, let's serve in a way that is pleasing to God, worth respect and awe, because our God really is a consuming fire. This ends the reading of the scripture. If a person decides to reflect on their life, they may see different versions of themselves. When I look back, I can see the hard-charging newspaper reporter, the crusading newspaper editor, the tough high school teacher, and now the preacher. It is as if I were several different people. In fact, I left the newspaper business in part because I didn't like the type of person I was becoming. As we go through changes in our life, we change, we adapt. In our faith journey, we will see God in different ways, For God to appear to us in different ways does not mean that God has changed. It means that we see God in different settings and contexts. To me, God has been a father figure, a source of support and forgiveness, a source of rebuke and discipline when I do wrong, and most importantly, I have felt reverence and awe in the presence of God. Take a moment to think of the ways that God has appeared to you how God has interacted with you through other believers, the Bible, teaching, preaching, and your experiences. God's people, the nation of Israel, also saw God in different ways. The Israelites saw one of those ways when they went to Mount Sinai after escaping from Egypt. These verses from Exodus 19 describe their encounter with God at Mount Sinai. Set up a fence for the people all around and tell them, Be careful not to go up the mountain or touch any part of it. Anyone who even touches the mountain must be put to death. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their place at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was all up in smoke because the Lord had come down on it with lightning. The smoke went up like the smoke of a hot furnace, while the whole mountain shook violently. The blast of the horn grew louder and louder. Moses would speak, and God would answer him with thunder. The people of Israel saw God in all of God's glory and power, but they were scared. They wouldn't go near the mountain for fear of dying. God's voice shook the earth. If a wild animal touched the mountain, it would have to be stoned. Moses was terrified and shaking, and God answered Moses with thunder. Imagine a mountain shaking. The word shake is used in many different ways. The word shaking is used in many different ways. One such use is the term shaken up. A stressful experience leaves a person shaken up. For example, in an automobile accident, the drivers and occupants of the cars may feel shaken up. When that happens, a person might re-examine their priorities. The trivial concerns of life mean little when life itself is threatened. In that sense, a shakeup has a positive outcome. In 1923, the people of Japan experienced a major earthquake. They were literally shaken up. The Japanese learned important lessons about building materials. Structures made of wood, paper, and brick collapsed. 
The buildings made of structural steel remained. A related term is shake out. It describes a period or process in which the relatively weak or unessential are eliminated. It is used to describe the reorganization of a business, market, or organization due to competition or change in the company. Workers who aren't performing up to standards may lose their jobs. The company leadership looks for ways to eliminate waste and improve efficiency. This results in many changes, some of which are painful. Ideally, the end result is a better company. One cause of shakeouts is complacency. If a company has some degree of success, there's a tendency for people to not work quite as hard and for management to fail to respond to changes. Believers can fall into the trap of complacency. If our lives are going relatively well, we may tend to pay too much attention to things that ultimately are of trivial value. If we fall into this trap, a painful shakeup might be necessary for us to reassess our priorities. In verse 26, God says, Still once more I will shake not only the earth, but heaven also. In shaking Mount Sinai, God shook up the people of Israel. Those of strong faith were in awe of God. Their strong faith enabled them to endure the shaking of the mountain. They became more determined to follow God. The Israelites whose faith was weak were terrified and wanted to get away from God. As the Israelites traveled in the wilderness, the shakeout continued. Israelites of little faith complained about their living conditions. Some of them even wished they were back in Egypt and living as slaves. They rationalized that in that life, they could at least count on being fed and having a place to live. The people of faith endured the discomfort in anticipation of living in the promised land. They survived the shakeout. The passage from Hebrews compares the worship in Mount Sinai with that of Mount Zion. In this reference, Mount Zion is not an actual physical mountain. You probably are familiar with the hymn, Marching to Zion. The hymn describes Zion as the beautiful city of God. This passage of scripture begins with describing the encounter with God at Mount Sinai, in which people were terrified of God and would not approach God. Yet we know as believers that we can approach God. We can see grace and mercy. Has God changed? No. What has changed is our access to God. Jesus Christ made it possible to see who God truly is. The first covenant God made with the Israelites is called the Old Covenant as compared to the New Covenant. The conditions under which the Old Covenant was given were dread, fear, distance, and exclusion. The Old Tabernacle with its curtain preserved the features of distance, exclusion, and inaccessibility. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, the curtain was torn. God was no longer separated from his people by a curtain. Jesus gave access to God to everyone. Unlike the Israelites who were afraid to approach God, we can approach God. We can interact with God. We can receive God's grace, mercy, joy, and peace. As believers, we do not approach Mount Sinai to worship God. We approach Mount Zion. The worship of God at Mount Sinai was tangible, therefore transient. When God shakes up the earth and heaven, the style of Mount Sinai is removed. The new worship at Mount Zion is invisible and spiritual. The old way inspired dread. We come to the Mount Zion worship with confidence. The darkness of gloom surrounded the old. Light and peace belonged to the new. The old covenant could not assure a man of sins forgiven. The new covenant is equal to man's deepest need. In relationships with God, we see God as approachable. We don't worry about stepping on the mountain. God wants to have a relationship with us. As we relate to God, there is one thing we must remember. As we approach God, be it through prayer or worship, we must include gratitude, reverence, and awe. Some styles of worship are mostly quiet and very reverent. I have been to Lutheran and Episcopal churches that use this kind of worship, and it does lead to a reverent attitude. Any worship service must allow us to show gratitude, to be reverent, and to stand in awe of the presence of God. An understanding of God's holiness and majesty is essential. I have also attended contemporary worship services. The music is similar to popular music. The congregation may clap, smile, and wave their arms. It can be exciting. But where is the gratitude, reverence, and awe? 
A well-designed contemporary service allows gratitude and reverence. It presents God's holiness and majesty. When I pray, I often conclude the prayer by saying, we thank you for what you've done for us and praise you for who you are. This closing includes gratitude and reverence. If a person is generous to us, we might fall into the trap of loving them only for what they give to us. We won't love them for who they are. God is holy. God deserves our reverence. We thank God for whom God is. We are to love God without conditioning that love on what God does for us. There are many seekers in our world these days, people who are seeking faith, seeking something spiritual. Many of them are not going to church. I think one reason seekers may not go to church is because they expect a Mount Sinai experience. They fear the preacher will preach about all the bad things in the world. And yes, as preachers, we do need to point out what's going on in our world. Yet we also must point out how faith in God helps us survive in a world that is becoming crazier all of the time. A seeker may see God only as someone to be afraid of. This is not the respectful fear of God, but instead a form of terror. An entire church can be a Mount Sinai church that is difficult to approach. Several years ago, my wife Cheryl and I were on a trip and decided to find a worship service to attend on one Sunday. At one of the churches we visited, the people seemed cold and aloof. There were no pleasant greetings. I'm not sure I saw anyone even smile. There was a lot of Mount Sinai in that church. Let's be a Mount Zion church. We need to be Mount Zion believers, thriving on our access to God and joyfully sharing our witness to God's goodness. We need to march to Zion. Amen.